The playoffs are well underway, and the Western Conference playoffs have one thing in common. The officiating. We will talk about the issues with some of the refereeing in the playoffs so far and much more on today's episode of Locked On NHL. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to Locked On NHL Western Conference Tuesdays. I am Brett Holden from Locked On Oilers and joining me as always, well, not last week, I guess, because you I didn't join you last week. It was all solo dolo for Dane from Locked On Stars. Dane, how are you? How was last week? I'm doing well. Uh, last week was great, but it's uh, always nice to to have you on here. I'm sure the, the folks at home missed having uh, that extra voice of reason. I'm sure everything I said... Uh, you know, or I know everything I said didn't go over smoothly. I was talking about how, you know, Colorado and Vegas would probably cruise to pretty easy series wins. And, you know, Vegas, it looks like that might be true. But Winnipeg steals game one, Colorado loses game one to Seattle. So uh, it looks like my picks are freezing cold when you're not around. But, you know, other than that, it went well. But we're, we're, we're glad to have you back this week. Hey, we all need somebody to keep us in check, and me as well. That is why I appreciate you deeply. Uh, On today's episode of Locked On NHL, you mentioned some of these series have been fantastic. But for some of them, if not all of them, there's been kind of a looming feeling over it. And it all comes down to the officiating. The officiating in the playoffs has been a hot button topic so far. And we saw it strike again last night between Colorado and Seattle. We will talk about that in just a second. But also on today's episode, we're a week through the playoffs already. So let's have a little bit of superlative fun. How about that? And we're going back to our yearbooks going, oh, who's the most famous? Uh, We're going to have a little bit of fun when it comes to the series so far in the playoffs and we will wrap up with some predictions for the rest of the first round for the western conference teams this has been an absolute treat of a playoff so far thank you so much for making locked on nhl your first listen every day we are free and available wherever you find your podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Well, Dane, a lot of people are buying tickets to go to NHL playoff games this playoff season, and as the games have been far from boring, and basically all of the series have been fantastic so far. There's been kind of a looming concern around the NHL and most specifically with NHL fans. And that has been with the officiating. And yes, I know there's a lot of people who go, oh, the officiating, you can't complain when your team loses. I understand where there, everybody, there's the, the, the right and wrong of it. But there seems to be a consistency in the inconsistencies in officiating so far in the NHL. You've seen it in your series with the Dallas Stars and the Minnesota Wild. I've seen it with the Edmonton Oilers and the Los Angeles Kings. We saw it last night between the uh, Seattle Kraken and the Colorado Avalanche and as well the Jets and the Golden Knights have also had their qualms with the referees. What is going on with the officiating in the playoffs so far, Dane? And do you think the complaints are warranted so far in the playoffs? I certainly think the complaints are warranted, and I feel like this is something we go through every playoffs. I mean, just because the the spotlight is so much brighter, the stage is bigger, and so everything is amplified, and that includes the play of the players, which has been excellent, and I know we're going to talk about some of that a little bit later on, but it also amplifies the mistakes from the referees who we know aren't perfect, but it just feels like there's been a lot that's gone wrong, Uh, and you mentioned even you know in the series that I've seen the most of, Minnesota and Dallas, you look at you know, a very important, decisive game for the wild. They're up two one. They have a chance to, you know, go up three one headed back to Dallas for game five. But they the, the stars get some pretty favorable calls against uh, Marcus Foligno calls that probably should not have been called. And the stars are able to execute on some power play opportunities. 
And, and, you know, that's not the only reason that the Stars won that some good plays from Jake Ottinger, but really that's what everyone's talking about, were these soft, quote-unquote, interference calls. And, and, I mean, I'm saying this as someone who is wanting the Stars to win this series. Like, those are awful calls, calls that should not have been whistled and, and you know, kind of really played a big hand in deciding the game. And it's not just that series. Uh, you mentioned Seattle caller. I mean, it's been every series, uh, and, yeah. I mean, Every team, I feel like, has a case to be made of how their team has been robbed or deprived of fair opportunities from the officiating. And it's a shame because, it, again, it does happen every year and it takes away from the product on the ice, which is what we should be talking about. Uh, because, I mean, there, there's some incredible stories to be told and some players that we maybe haven't been, you know, that, that have come out of nowhere or, you know, stepping up for their team in a big way or teams in general overperforming and, and playing to a level that maybe we didn't expect. But here we are you know, discussing the officiating, uh, which is there to help, you know, regulate the game and make sure the game is, you know, played clean, played fairly. Uh, but it just hasn't really been the case through the first week or so of the postseason. And let's talk about player safety a little bit here, because last night we saw Kale McCarr run Jared McCann into the boards after the whistle. I mean, uh, the, the fan was already celebrating, catching the puck, and then all of a sudden Jared McCann is now getting hit. And Kale McCarr says last night, oh, I wasn't really trying to finish him off that hard. Well, he goes into him. I, I, it, let's be real. It's a dirty play. It's a dirty mm. play, and, and not from a dirty player. I'm not calling yeah. from yeah. a dirty player by any means, but it's a dirty play. And the fact that they still went and reviewed it, gave him the initial five-minute major. The thing is, I think people need to realize that when the five-minute major is called, that gives the refs the opportunity to go and take a look at it and maybe either reduce it or they say yes. So once that initial call is made five minutes, that's great. That means they are willing to go and take a look at it. That's perfect. But once you go and take a look at it, you better make the right call. And the fact that Jared McCann will likely not be back in this series, the Seattle Krakens, one of their top scorers this season, isn't going to be back is not great because of a call that you are now making. The fact that Kale McCarr is having a hearing to later today, now it might come out while we are recording this, so uh, bear with us here. But the fact that he is getting that hearing proves that that was in some form dirty. How does that not then warrant a five-minute major? Because everybody and their mother sees it. Here's a, a, a pretty interesting thing that I came across this morning. This is from Adam Seaborn from uh, Playmaker. And he said, all accounts round one is not living up to expectations or Sportsnet's expectations on viewership. Winnipeg series estimated to have over 1 million per game, delivering only about 50% of that 1 million. And the Leafs and Bolts have yet to eclipse 3 million. Now I know the Leafs and Bolts are Eastern Conference, but... That's still a big ticket deal. Why is this happening? Well, maybe it's the fact that some fans feel disrespected when they're watching games. It feels like the fans are now sitting there going, I don't even know what, the, what, are, we, what, are, what are we watching here? Because that's not a penalty, but this is. And, and you see so often calls now influencing games, as you mentioned, in just the Minnesota-Dallas uh, uh, game by itself. Let's talk about the Oilers and the Kings, why don't we? Because that has mm. been potentially the worst series when it comes to officiating so far. And yes, maybe again, that is the Oilers' bias. But uh, even in Game 4, when Kevin Fiala got a tripping call for hitting Leon Dreisaitl, the Edmonton Oilers went on to tie the game after being down 3 nothing off of that call off of a bad call for hitting Leon Dreisaitl in a legal way. Then you see the high-sticking call that ends up ending the game in overtime that, yeah, there's all this conversation. Oh, no, it didn't hit the stick. When you can clearly see it change direction, hit the stick, come back down, and then people don't know the rule going, oh, it hit Ekholm's back, so it doesn't matter. This is the issue. That these games are being decided by bad calls and fans are no longer coming back. But Dane, I'll throw this to you here, but what is the difference now? And why do people need to realize that playoffs need to be called differently because these are the playoffs? Am I out to lunch here? No, I, I think 
that, that, that there's certainly an argument to be made there. It's just I, I feel like it's so tricky from the league perspective of what do you do differently or how, how do you officiate it differently? Because you also can't please everyone. If you mm-hmm. make some sort of changes or adjustments, there's going to be you know a, a, a mass of people that dislike that and say, oh, we should go back to the old ways. And, and yeah, it, it's frustrating because I feel like hockey is in a really great spot where they have you know some very marketable players high profile players that are fun to watch, but also do have a little bit of personality. And this is an opportunity. And I feel like, you know, over the past couple of seasons, as these major TV networks have picked up NHL deals like ESPN, uh, TNT, like it's getting national attention. I feel like that's the opportunity for more people to come watch. And people say all the time, like there's no postseason, like like the NHL postseason. Like I, I can't say like hockey's certainly up there for me, but like I'm, I'm, you know, growing up in Texas, a big football guy. I love the NFL. I love the NFL playoffs. But the rush of watching the Stanley Cup playoffs, I mean, you can't replicate that. And it's being ruined because of the officiating. And it's turning fans off from the game, potential new fans, you know, frustrated that they're watching these games get decided by these guys wearing the striped shirts and whether or not they feel something is a a, a penalty or not. And, and I know, again, that they're not perfect and they're going to make mistakes, but it feels like they're making too many mistakes. and wasting what could be a a really really fun tournament and it has been to some extent but it's also got plenty of stains from it from the officiating and so I I can't say I blame these new fans that are trying to get into the game or follow a team through the playoffs for the first time and getting exposed to this uh, because it it is quite literally determining the fate of teams and it's I mean in the west but it's in the east as well I know that that you know Carolina the Islanders was that game two a missed call that leads to a Carolina game winning goal I mean it's all over the place Mm -hmm. it's not just in the western conference so it's frustrating because hockey it always just feels like at least in the past couple of seasons it's had this chance to really boom and and grow and bring in a new audience and it's moments like these that really hinder that that opportunity for growth and and the unfortunate thing is is that it also doesn't stop with the new fans my Mm -hmm. father has has been a a hockey fan and i'm just using my father as an example we've seen this on social media all over the place but my father, who has been watching hockey for 50 plus years, is sitting there going, I, I don't want to watch anymore because I feel offended as a hockey fan because I it, it feels like the NHL is just spitting in the face of hockey fans because it, it seems like we don't know what penalties are anymore. We don't know. And then all of a sudden, if you say or complain, it goes, ah, uh, uh, well, actually... It's just, it really is a a real stain on what should be, like you said, uh, one of the best tournaments in all of sport. Because let's be real, hockey is the best sport on planet Earth, and the playoffs cannot make it any more intense. But when you start taking that out of the hands of the players, it just doesn't make it fun anymore. Even Leon Dreisaitl said after game three, he said, I don't know what the standard is. When the players don't know what the standard is, how can you expect them to go out there and be disciplined when there's no discipline that has been laid out there? But enough of us complaining about the refs. Let's talk about the game that is going on on the ice because that's what we're here for. We're here to talk about the product on the ice, and we have had anything but sleepy series, but we have had some unbelievable series as well some boring series let's get into that real yearbook type feel and throw some superlatives at the playoffs in the western conference so far we will do that in just a second but first today's episode is brought to you by indeed indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract interview and hire all in one place Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like matching, assessments, and virtual interviews. Hate waiting? Indeed's U.S. data shows over 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed uh, matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. Indeed knows when you're growing your business, you need to have every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash locked on to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. 
Need to hire? You need Indeed. All righty, Dane, let's have some fun with these playoffs here. We complained enough. No more, no more <laughs> negativity. Well, maybe there's some negativity a little bit in these superlatives, but we have some superlatives for series. We have some uh, superlatives for players as well. So let's have a little bit of fun here. Let's start off with the most obvious one. Let's start off with the most entertaining series in the Western Conference so far. Dane, for you, is... I'm torn and I've gone back and forth since we brought this up and it's it would be easy for me to lean stars wild because it has been entertaining. But I'm going to go with, with the series that you're probably tied closest to with with Edmonton L.A. just purely for that game for that comeback was incredible. And, and I feel like that that's really going to spark the rest of this series that I feel like could go to seven games like it did last year. I, I think that's that's the series to watch here down the stretch. Dallas, Dallas, Minnesota has been great. Colorado, Seattle has been great. I'll probably talk about both of those here in this segment, but I mean, that comeback for uh, Edmonton, uh, what was that Sunday night? Yeah. Unbelievable. And, and I mean, that season saving type game where it's like, Oh, Edmonton's about to go down three, one to LA the year that, you know, they, they make all these moves at the deadline. And I, I'm, I'm, I imagine it felt pretty hopeless, but then that turnaround, I mean, the rush of watching a, a comeback like that is pretty special. Oh, I was working. I was working my other job at the time where we were hosting a watch party at a, a local bar here. And it, I, I had to tell you from the second for from the first period to the second period, the changes within 20 minutes was just abysmal to electric. It was absolutely insane. And they score again. It was uh, it just uh, there is a reaction on Oilers Nation right now that includes me on there. <laughs> it, it, my shirt flew up. It was unbelievable. I didn't realize when Zach Hyman scored the goal. It was unbelievable. You have to take a look at it. But I, I agree with you as, as uh, that has been a very interesting entertaining series plus there's a whole lot of storylines with that series as well that each game seemingly just follows into the next one so and there's a lot of uh, hatred between those two teams right now as well so uh, maybe we'll talk about that series a little later on for me though yeah, I'm not going to say the Oilers and the Kings. I guess that one's a little bit of a handoff, too. I'm going to say the Kraken and the Avalanche because the Kraken are in their first playoff series. The fans have been fantastic in games three and four in Seattle. They're playing against the team who won the Stanley Cup last year, the defending Stanley Cup champions against the team who is playing in their first ever playoff series. And last night, Jordan Eberle pulls off what seems to be 18-year-old Jordan Eberle once again at the World juniors against Russia with five seconds left. Jordan Eberle! Wow! Just unbelievable stuff to see as they go into game five tied at two. And sometimes it didn't seem like that. It's just, there's, again, so many storylines to follow. We'll see if Kale McCarr is eventually suspended, which would be another player that the Avalanche don't have. That has been an unbelievable series. Let's flip from the opposite, though, let's go from the most entertaining to the most boring series so far of the uh, Western Conference uh, playoffs. And it seems like we both kind of have the same answer. Yeah, I mean, it goes without saying it's it's Vegas, Winnipeg. And I mean, there's parts of it that have been entertaining. It certainly was interesting when, you know, Winnipeg steals game one at the Fortress and you think, OK, maybe they have a shot and they play kind of competitively through early other stages of the game or uh, other stages of the series, excuse me. But I mean, I think this is what we all expected and Winnipeg has good pieces. They have Connor Hellebuck, but now they're without Josh Morrissey. They're, they're shorthanded. And they're, I know that they've just kind of been in a weird spot all season where they've been a playoff team, but there's so much inner turmoil within the organization. Vegas, uh, clearly a more superior team. We're getting Jack Eichel, in his first ever playoff series, which feels very bizarre given how long he's been around the league. But I mean, he's looked good. The, the rest of the Golden Knights overall look very solid. Definitely not a perfected team in the postseason yet, but I, I think that they'll probably finish finish business in game five at home. Uh, and then they'll be, you know, waiting for the winner of that Edmonton LA series. So interesting at times, but when you compare this that that series to the other three, uh, I mean it's it's certainly a little bit of an afterthought. And I feel bad because, I mean, think of game three. That game three was exhilarating. Yeah, yeah. They came back. They scored late. It went to double overtime. And, of course, double overtime and had to be none other than Michael Amadio. 
scoring the game winner. Like I feel bad because they're all, all the other series have been absolutely fantastic. You just kind of have to pick this one because it's three, one, but again, it's it, again, it, it's because of the competitiveness and the fact that this is probably done tomorrow night or in game five, whenever that, that is uh, off the top of my head. Cause now, now with game fours and fives and sixes, now the schedule. Yeah, I think it's getting, Thursday. Yeah. Thursday, Thursday, or, Thursday night. Thank you for that. See, that's why I keep you around. Dane. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. Is it, is the on ice product boring? No, far from the truth, but let's be real here. It's probably done sooner than the other ones. All righty. Let's move on from the most boring to the most physical series so far. Which one do you think that is for you, Dane? Uh, most physical. I, I will lean into the stars bias and I'll say stars wild. And it truly, I, I think has been maybe not just in the Western conference, but maybe the entire postseason. Uh, and this was to be expected with, you know, the players present in this series on both parties. You have, you know, Jamie Benn on the star side, Yanni Hockenpah, big body. But with the Minnesota Wild, you have Ryan Reeves, Matt Dumba. I mean, that whole team really is just not afraid of physicality and not necessarily the stars brand of hockey, but they do have guys that can get physical and get big when they need to. Uh, and clearly it's had its fingerprints all over the series. We see that hit from Dumba on Joe Pavelski in game one. I mean, it, it's just been all over. Uh, these two teams don't like each other. There's a little bit of, I mean, division rivals. I think it's similar to Edmonton, LA, and this was to be expected. And it, I mean, it's been said, and, and I agree with it. I don't remember who I heard say it, but whoever wins this series uh, is going to come out with a ton of battle scars uh, yeah. and has a very good chance to potentially make it to the Western Conference Finals. I mean, these are two really good teams, and I mean, it's been inc it's been a bloodbath on the ice in all four games. Now, for me, it has been. And I think that hit that you mentioned from Dumba really set the tone for the rest of the series. Yes. For me, though, I'm going by the numbers. And I'm going to show some love for Winnipeg and, and Vegas right now. As that one, for me, is literally the most physical. As in the playoffs so far, the Winnipeg Jets, through four games, have thrown 232 hits. Not to be outdone by the Vegas Golden Knights, who in four games have thrown 191. These are two teams who are going out there and absolutely punishing each other, which we saw again in game three. They just went out there in the first 20 minutes. I don't think Winnipeg even tried to put a puck on net. I think they just went out there and tried to bang bodies, and they did. And, and, and I think that really adds to the 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 series there as well the last uh series superlative that we have before we get into the games as well is the series with the most bad blood i am my answer here and again this one might be a little biased but dane what series do you think has the most bad blood between these two teams i i think dallas minnesota has you know some consideration there colorado seattle doesn't I mean, Seattle doesn't really have bad blood with anyone just yet because they're so new, but I'd love for this series to maybe go to seven games and we get a little bit of a, you know, rivalry between two teams, even though they're not in the same division. Vegas, Winnipeg, kind of the same thing. Vegas, obviously, a lot of teams don't like them, but I mean, two different areas of, of the continent, not really a whole lot of connection there, but I, I'll, I'll lean into the one that I think you're probably going to pick just because it carries over from last year. Division rivals, LA, Edmonton. I think there was bad blood there at the start of last season series. It carries over through seven games. It carries into the regular season when these teams match up. And I think it's found its way back into this series. And so just, just for that reason, for how long a lot of the, the, these two teams with a lot of the same cast members have been going head to head, I, I'll do it purely for that reason. Uh, although I do think stars wild is probably a close second with the, the division rivalry as well, but they, they didn't play each other in the first round last season. So I, I will go Edmonton LA for that reason. I am going Edmonton, LA, but I do want to go the honorable mention as well with the Stars and the uh, Wild as well because, I mean, the Stars are from Minnesota. It's the Minnesota North Stars, right? So That's true. I, and and a lot of former Stars on the Minnesota team. True. Zuccarello, and Klingberg, yes, uh, Ryan Hartman, I think, was like technically a member of the organization at one point. I don't think he ever played, but I think mm. he was around at one point. So. <laughs> That's a good point. And a lot of stars are from Minnesota. Too. Yeah. So, Jake Ottinger, uh, Minnesota, yeah, yeah. Lakeville, Minnesota native. 
<laughs> there you go. And but yeah, I think for me it has to be the Oilers and and the Kings. These are two teams who genuinely hate each other. There is not a lot of love between these two teams, and it sucks personally for me because I have family in Los Angeles. My aunt actually texted me saying, "I think I convinced your uncle to go out and watch the game tonight." But the LA Kings fans do not like Edmonton Oilers fans and vice versa. And it translates out onto the ice. We've seen so many different things with hits the last or uh, the second game of the season between the Oilers and the Kings this year. There were three fights between Yessa Pugliarvi and Brandon Lemieux. Uh, Sean Dursey fought Zach Hyman and I'm pretty sure Lemieux dropped it again with Clean Costin. Like these were, these are teams who don't like each other at all. And we are seeing it play out once again in probably what's going to be seven full games. That's going to be exciting. Let's move on to the players and let's kind of wrap this up here. Let's be uh, quick on this one. We're running a little long in the tooth here, but that's okay. We're having fun. It's the playoffs. Who's been the best player so far in the playoffs in the Western Conference? We're going quick and it could go a lot of ways. I'm going to go Miko Rantanen. He's been Ooh. a stud for the Avalanche through the early stages of this series. Five goals tied. Uh, with Leon Dreisaitl and Chris Kreider for the most through the playoffs so far. And even last night, I mean, he scored both goals for Colorado, some really slick passing plays and just good poise, good focus from Miko Rantanen. I've really liked what I've seen from him. Uh, he's been fantastic so far. I do agree. But I, I guess my bias will show again with this one, and that is Leon Dreisaitl, who has nine points so far this playoff se series season, I guess you can also say as well. But it doesn't stop there. Leon Dreisaitl has been out on the ice for all 14 goals the Edmonton Oilers have produced. And as mentioned, he's uh, also contributed on nine of those 14 points mm -hmm. without or 14 goals without Connor M or McDavid being who Connor McDavid is. Leon Dreisaitl is now making the argument of being one of the best playoff performers in the world. And right now he is only behind Wayne Gretzky for the best points per game in NHL playoff history behind Wayne Gretzky. No, it's not Mario Lemieux. No, it's not Yammer Yager. You can go on and on and on. It is Leon Dreisaitl. So for me, so far, it's been Leon Dreisaitl. Let's go to the most surprising player so far. Who has surprised you the most in these playoffs for you? I'm, I'm going to go in net for this one. I'm going to say Philip Grubauer for, for Seattle. I mean, it's, it's not like Vesna level goaltending. I mean, he's he's had some faults here and there, but even watching uh, game four last night in Seattle, I mean, he's making some incredible saves. I mean, uh, we I know we've talked about at length the Seattle team has nice pieces on the forward and defenseman front, but the goaltending's been shaky. And Grubauer, he's been far from perfect, but he's made some excellent saves and certainly, I think, played a key in getting this series to being tied. So I'll, I'll, I'll go Philip Grubauer uh, for my most surprising player. I really like that answer. I really do like that answer. For me, I'm going Adam Lowry of the Winnipeg Jets. I think Adam Lowry has really shown just his real value to the NHL and to the Winnipeg Jets as well. A guy who's scored many clutch goals. But not only that, he has been a, a player who will go out there, fight guys. He took an absolute licking in the first shift of game three, and he bounced back and ended up scoring that game-tying goal for the Winnipeg mm -hmm. Jets. He has been fantastic for the Jets, and I would be very concerned where they would be without him so far. So for me, I would go Adam Lowry. Uh, let's move on to the best goalie. You mentioned Philip Grubauer, so we're going to nix that one. Who do you think has been the best goalie so far? It's tough because it's the West especially has been odd where there's been, you know, a, a good amount of goal scoring in some of these games. I will, even being someone who covers the stars, I will uh, tip my hat to Philip Gustafson, who's had a really nice Stanley Cup playoffs debut. Uh, 1.72 goals against average, uh, save percentage at 9.41. He and Jake Ottinger have been going toe to toe this whole series outside of game two, where the Wild decided to start Marc Andre Fleury, and that ended up not working out very well as the stars scored seven goals in that game. So, I mean, maybe this series looks a little bit different if. Philip Gustafson gets that game two start. So I'll, I'll give all the credit to him, a, a guy who came over uh, in the offseason uh, from Ottawa, I believe. And there were a lot of questions about what he could do. And he's so far through four games been very solid for Minnesota. So I will I'll say my best goaltender so far is Philip Gustafson. But we'll, we'll have to do all this superlative stuff again at some point yeah. uh, in the playoffs once once we get some more sample size. But I, I will go Philip Gustafson as of right now.
And it's pretty shocking considering how there's a lot of conversation whether or not who's going to start in net for the Minnesota Wild right now. Uh, for me, it's, again, we're going back to the oilers uh, King series. It's Jonas Corposalo. Jonas Corposalo has been... Uh, sometimes I watch the saves that he make. I'm like, why are we playing Jonathan Quick 2.0? Why are we playing Jacques Plante? Why are we playing Patrick Waugh 2.0? The amount of times he just makes saves that he just straight up shouldn't is insane. Right now, he is fourth in the NHL when it comes to goals saved above average. So basically the amount of goals that should be past him that he's stopping. He has a 2.68 behind Igor Shosturkin, Akira Schmid, and Philip Gustafson, who is on top. Two more questions for you here. Let's start off with the most disappointing player so far in the playoffs. Oh, I had such a good one for this. And oh, I, I, I'll, I'll say go from the Dallas Stars perspective. Uh, and it's weird to say most disappointing because there's probably another area to go. But Jason Robertson, while he is a point per game player right now with the goal and three assists through four mm -hmm. games, really just hasn't taken over. I think like people expected him to with you know his over forty goal season for the second time in a row. First Dallas star to score hundred points in a season, and you he hasn't been a non factor. But you, I mean, and this is a guy who historically is great against the Minnesota Wild. Had a hat trick against them last season in Minnesota. Uh, after the previous game, getting a hat trick in Winnipeg. I mean, this guy has done it all against this Minnesota team, and he's really been held in check, which you do have to give credit to Minnesota's defense. And, and you know, he's still making some plays and getting the puck to Rope Hints or getting it to Tyler Sagan. But I've really been expecting more from Jason Robertson uh, through the early stages of this series, and may maybe he'll pop off in, in Game 5 tonight. We'll see. Yeah, that I, again, like we mentioned, uh, we talked a lot about Jason Robertson this year, obviously, as we should have. And yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I, and I think that's kind of happening with Connor McDavid as well. So I'm not going to say Connor McDavid is my most disappointing player because, again, he still has six points in four games, two goals, four assists. But when you take a look at what Leon's doing, he is absolutely running away with it. So Connor will be an honor honorable mention. But for me, it's Kale McCarr. Kale McCarr is mm. three points in four games. He's probably going to end up getting suspended after an absolute bonehead play. And he hasn't looked like that good old Bobby Orr, Kale McCarr that we're all used to seeing in these playoffs. So for me, most disappointing has been Kale McCarr. Let's wrap up this long, long uh, uh, series here, long uh, segment here with the best crowd let's give some love to the fans here because they've been enduring us so far in this episode what is the best crowd that you've seen in the playoffs so far this is going to be a little bit of recency bias but i think i'm going to go with seattle i mean it's their first Ooh. go around in the playoffs uh, and i i'd gone to bed before the end of the game last night but woke up and you know watched the highlights to see how that game ended and i mean just watching that eberly game-winning goal and to see climate pledge arena explode like that i mean it's awesome uh, to see an expansion team in season two, in the playoffs, and winning games like that, and to see that crowd as into the game as they were. I think all the playoff crowds have been great. Uh, obviously, I haven't been in the midst of them, so I'm only seeing them from TV. But, I mean, Minnesota, Dallas has great energy. I know Edmonton always brings it. Vegas, even Winnipeg. The whiteout up in Winnipeg is, is an iconic NHL playoff staple when they're there. So, uh, And even, I know Los Angeles. I know sometimes people can say, oh, people in L.A. only go to sporting events for, for clout or for, you know, to get social media followers, but they, I mean, they, they've brought the energy as well. Uh, I, hey, uh, Los Angeles, I, again, I have family there, so I go to, I'm always going to call it the Staples Center. I go to the Staples Center all the time. I've seen a, a bunch of Kings games, and those fans are insane. Those fans are fantastic. So I will give LA their love there, but I'm going with the whiteout in Winnipeg. That, uh, you mentioned, just one of the best fan traditions that there are in sports right now, and it's so electric. I have a buddy of mine who's in Winnipeg who's going, and he sent me a video of the fight at the start of the game in Game 3 as well, and it was electric. You couldn't hear anything, anything. So I'm giving the love to Winnipeg while we still can at least. <laughs> Alrighty, let's wrap up today's episode with a little bit of predictions with the rest of the series as this time next week, we're going to have an, an idea as to what's going to happen in the second round. But before we get there, these series have to end some way. So we're going to give our predictions for the rest of the first round in just a second. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Dane, as you know, as you had to do the episode solo dolo last week, I was stuck in Toronto, 
over the weekend, but I mean, I didn't, I decided to go to Toronto, but a lot to do in Toronto that weekend. And we were sitting there at a specific Canadian coffee shop that I probably shouldn't mention right now. As we were sitting there going, Hmm, what should we do tonight? We found tickets to the Toronto FC versus Atlanta United game. And guess where we sat finding tickets that morning. I'm assuming it's somewhere nice, given given where this is going, midfield maybe, or maybe in the the, the first couple rows of the st- of the stadium. Yeah, fourth row in the corner of the game, and we're like right in the corner. We were watching all of the corner kicks. Richie Larea scored a banger and celebrated right in front of us. It was fantastic, and we got those tickets that morning on game time. One press or two taps, and we already had our tickets. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Get images of your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive and buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps and you're set. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked on NHL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, Dane, we are absolutely in the thick of it for the playoffs. And these series are far from over. Well, one of them might be, but the uh, Colorado Avalanche and the Seattle Kraken are tied at 2-2. The Dallas Stars and the Minnesota Wild are tied at 2-2. The Edmonton Oilers and the Los Angeles Kings also tied at two games apiece. And the Las Vegas Golden Knights, sorry for calling them Las Vegas, as a 3-1 lead over the Winnipeg Jets. Let's start off at the top with the Colorado Avalanche and the Seattle Kraken, the game that we saw and the last game that has been played as of right now in the NHL. A big winner in overtime from Jordan Eberle. There will be a promised game six, but Dane, will that be the last game of the series to you? I don't think so. I think Seattle has shown enough fight that I think this game is going to go seven. I think Colorado wins game five. And then I think Seattle probably plays similarly to the way that they did in game four, where they're not, they will be backed into a corner. I think in that situation, because it's win or go home, but Mm -hmm. I think they'll find a way to win. I know that they're fired up and and wanting to win. I'm sure for Jared McCann after that whole Kale McCarr McCann sequence in the corner, I mean, I I'm really am surprised by Seattle. I thought, you know, that they were kind of like a nice story. And it's like, oh, you like, congrats, you made the playoffs, uh, you know, your second season of existence. But now you have to play the defending champions. But they've handled themselves well. I think that they'll find a way to get the game, the series to seven. But I do think Colorado ultimately ends up winning uh, in game seven on their home ice. That uh, could you imagine Seattle's first series going seven games? Like, I, I, it would be. That is how you draw fans into the sport. And mm-hmm. it's been fantastic so far. For me, I was shocked that the the Kraken came out with the split. I mean, they came out with the win in game one. So they were obviously going to come out with the split in uh, Colorado. And then they come out with the split once again against the, the Avalanche in game four. My thing will be, A, how long is Jared McCann out? And B, how long is Kale McCarra? Those are two of, if not the top players on each team. Obviously, the uh, Avalanche also have Nathan McKinnon, Nico Rantanen, blah, 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 blah. But as you mentioned, the Seattle Kraken have shown all year they were in the top three for a long portion of the season until the Edmonton Oilers really made their run. And then the Calgary Flames went, (laughs) and they were gone too. So, This is still a very good Seattle Kraken team who has played together for these last two years. There wasn't really a lot of movement from year one to year two. And you see them really bonding. And this is how you see a good team become a great team. 
I still think the Colorado Avalanche are the Colorado Avalanche, so they will move on, but it is going to be tight. It could go seven, but I could see them just winning out for the rest of the series. They made that two-goal uh, deficit into an overtime game as well. And if I'm not mistaken, they were trailing in that first game or in the third game as well, if I'm uh, mm-hmm. remembering I, that game too. Yeah, I think Seattle scored first in every game so far this series. Wow. So. Yeah, I mean they they've had a shot. They've had a shot in every game. And that's that's fantastic to see, right? That's I really hope that the the Kraken can pull it off, but if I had to make my choice it's probably going to be Colorado. All righty, let's move on to your series, the Dallas Stars and the Minnesota Wild, which has been an absolute bloodbath in the literal and figurative sense as well. How do you see this one playing out because this has been one of the most tighter series of the uh even though what there was a seven goal game too between you guys right yeah. so this yeah. has been an, an interesting series how do you see it playing out it, i mean i'm obviously very biased but i think the stars do end up winning it's it's probably gonna go seven as well i think dallas i mean game five tonight in texas a lot on the line in terms of who's going to win this game dallas needs to find a way to win but I think that they will. I, I know Minnesota is probably is not even probably they are the more physical team. They have more of those enforcer kind of guys on their roster. And sometimes that's come to their benefit. But the Stars, I don't think it's a stretch to say they are the better team. There's a reason they finished higher in the standings in Minnesota. You look at the skill on the rosters. I think Dallas, it, it leans a little bit more in their favor. Joe Pavelski is skating again. I don't know if he's going to be a go for game five, but it looks like he could potentially come back for game six or maybe game seven if it's necessary. But the, inter- the most interesting thing to me with this series and what, what I'm going to be keeping an eye on is the play of the two superstar guys. I talked about Jason Robertson earlier in the episode. He's kind of been held in check relatively. Again, it feels weird saying that about a point-per-game player, but I feel like a guy of his caliber needs to be more than a point-per-game player in the postseason. But Kirill Kaprizov has also kind of been quiet in this series. He, he's made plays every now and then. He scored the first goal of the series on the power play for Minnesota. But both of those guys, the, the superstars of their teams, haven't really been the big storylines in this series. So I'm curious to see which of those guys steps up over these next couple of games and, and tries to help lead their team to a series win. Because uh, I think if one of those guys can really kind of take the reins, that could really be a huge difference maker uh, for either team. And so uh, that's something I'm going to be keeping an eye on. But I think the Stars end up winning. I, I do think it probably goes to seven games. Dallas wins game five. Minnesota defends home ice. But then I think it ends in Texas uh, in game seven with the Stars winning. And see, the thing with Minnesota is I feel like Minnesota should have been so much better this year. And you mention it. Like, I, I don't think you're out to lunch by saying Dallas is the better team by any means because Minnesota swung under their weight all year. I do think Dallas will end up pulling this out. I just think Minnesota isn't strong enough. I think there's a lot still going on that they're still trying to figure out. Gustafson will evidently be their goalie potentially of the future, but you still have to remember that they have Jesper Volstead coming up too. Right. So Fleury is going to be gone. Um, this year, I assume is probably his last year. I mean, you never know, I guess with Mark Andre Fleury, but yeah, no, I, I just think that this team is more looking to the future. Matt Boldy is looking fantastic, but I don't think he's ready for a big run. Kirill Kaprizov is fantastic too, and the addition of Ryan Reeves has made the Minnesota Wild that much more difficult to play against. But I just think Dallas has too much firepower, the better goaltending or better goaltender, I should say at least when it comes to pedigree. So I'm going to go with the Dallas Stars as well. And the fact that we might get three of the four series go to seven is insane. But let's go to the series that probably isn't going seven. The Vegas Golden Knights and the Winnipeg Jets, which, yes, we deemed it the most boring, but only because there's so many storylines for every other series so far. But, Dane, do you think there's a chance in, in the whiteout that the Winnipeg Jets can come back and win this series? There's always a chance, absolutely. But I, I, if you're if you're Vegas, you you don't want to go back to Winnipeg. You don't want to go back to the whiteout because you know how diff. I mean, it's been uh, it looked a little bit easier last night, I guess, to some degree. Although I, you know, it wasn't. It's never easy to win a playoff game in the NHL. But I mean, Game Three, the the Vegas Golden Knights had to scrape and claw their way to that win, and so they they know that this is a must win game coming up for them on Thursday. You have to take care of business at the Fortress. I think they will, but it's it's not going to be easy. I mean, this is a, a Rick Bonus team. You mentioned all the hits that Winnipeg has. I mean, that that's Rick Bonus hockey right there. The the physicality, the hits, the heavy checks. 
it, it's not going to be an easy win for Vegas. I think that they will find a way to win, but I mean, it, it's going to probably be a one goal game or maybe even an overtime game winner. I mean, yeah, we say quote unquote most boring series, but the product on the ice, like you said earlier, has still been fantastic. Uh, it's just the outlier because the series isn't, t- isn't tied at two apiece, but it very easily could have been. So I say Vegas probably wins this series on Thursday night, but Winnipeg is not going to go down without a fight because of who their coach is and who some of their leadership is. Blake Wheeler, Mark Shifley, those guys aren't just going to roll over. So I'm expecting a, a, an incredible game, uh, but one that I think Vegas ultimately finds a way to win. Yeah, I feel like we're defending that most boring thing a lot here, eh? But uh, no, 100%. It's <laughs> Again, it is the outlier with the series where it's at but it's been fantastic. And I think Winnipeg, like you mentioned, is going to give them a good fight as Winnipeg has all year, a team who is at one point at the top of the central division. And then they fell to the second wild card spot. And I think now we're seeing why they fell to that wild card spot. And yes, I think it'll be done by game six at the latest. And that's not to be, and that's not a knockdown to the Winnipeg Jets by any means. I think they have been a, a very good playoff team, but I think that's more saying the Vegas Golden Knights haven't been the number one seed that everybody expected them to be. Yes, mm-hmm. they'll probably win this in five games, but it has not been an easy five games by any means, at least by the first four games. In fact, they lost the first game at the Fortress, as you mentioned, at Team mobile Arena. Like That is a tough game to lose the first game in. So I do have uh, the Vegas Golden Knights moving on in six, but eh, eh, I wouldn't count the Jets out just yet. And let's wrap up with the Oilers and the Kings, the one that has the most amount of storylines in it. You got Connor and Leon, the rematch from last year, the referee show over the last few days, Kevin Fiala returned, Gabriel Velarde has been a great addition, and to top it all off, Will Ferrell. Who do you <laughs> think will win this series between the Edmonton Oilers and the Los Angeles Kings take two? This this is a tough one. And I, I go back and forth because this is this series is quite literally like an unstoppable force and an immovable object. Because on one side, you have Edmonton who made it to the conference finals last season. And the expectation is they have to at least make it back there, if not further. Otherwise, it's a disappointment. But then you have this Kings team with a few new faces that go out and they get Kevin Fiala. Uh, they get Jonas Corposalo in goal. I mean, they have they they've made the moves to be a contender, and so I mean, one of these teams unfortunately has to lose and go home in round one. And, and I feel like the team that's ultimately going to win is Edmonton. Home ice advantage, I think, plays a big role. But I think I, I mean it's Connor McDavid. I mean, he's not doing a ton right now, but if he can eventually get back to doing what we know he can do, alongside what Leon's doing, there, there's hardly anyone in the league that can stop it. I still think it goes seven. It's going to be a nail-biting type series, but I I think Edmonton ultimately gets the win in in seven games. The question here for me is when is Connor getting let loose? Because it has been an unbelievable... The fact that he has not had... Well, basically had the shackles on him the entire series, and the fact that he has six points in those four games is still something to be said. I think that, again, the Edmonton Oilers have been the better team at five on five in three of the last four games, except for game four, the most recent game. But the Oilers still outscored the LA Kings 5-1 after the first period in game four. There's been arguments that the Edmonton Oilers could have been up 3-0 after the first three games because of some of the officiating that has happened. That is where I kind of go into this because I think that the Edmonton Oilers have completely outplayed the LA Kings in many facets of the game, but Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Zach Hyman has not been uh, or have at all been who we expected them to be in this series. Yes, Hyman got the game-winning goal in Game 4, and we'll see if that can carry over, but the fact that Evan Bouchard has seven points in this series, who I was going to say it was my surprising player if I didn't want to pound it up with all the Oilers in there as well, but seven points, Echo yeah been uh, adding to his game, but I don't think Ekholm has been at his best either. We have the fact maybe Jack Campbell starts tonight for the Oilers as well. We don't know. I think the Edmonton Oilers will start to figure it out. The Oilers fans are fantastic at Rogers Place, and I'm going to be down there tonight as well. It's going to be a a great experience, but this, I think, will go... 
I, I wouldn't be shocked if the Oilers win out in the next two games. I think the Oilers are, are have a fire under their butt right now. They just came back from that three, nothing deficit. They are going to have Connor McDavid with again, that fire under their butt with the fans chanting their names. This is going to be a big game tonight for the Oilers and the Kings. And I think if the Oilers win game five, they're going to win game six. Because it'll be the first time in the series that one team has won two consecutive games. And I think once that starts going, the Edmonton Oilers might get the ball ro- rolling. But I wouldn't be shocked if it goes seven. Alrighty, Dane, we have kept the people long enough. This has been an absolutely unbelievable playoff so far. So for all of the Dallas Stars coverage for the playoffs, where can the people find you? Yeah, they can find me at Dane Double underscore Lewis on Twitter or just search our show at Locked on Stars, Instagram and Twitter and just search the show name wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. And uh, I would say Minnesota fans are welcome to check it out as well. But most of them have already found my content and made their presence felt in the comments section uh, with only only the nicest things being said. Uh, So that's where the people can find me. But what about you for uh, for all your Oilers coverage? Well, you can find me personally at the real Holden 40. That's on all social medias. I'm talking Twitter. I'm talking Instagram. I think I had to change my Tinder as well, but you don't have to worry about me. You worry about the Edmonton Oilers and this unbelievable potential playoff run that they are going on. So you can find locked on Oilers on Twitter at locked on Oilers. Exactly how it sounds. Or you can find us on YouTube where we are going to be changing studios. I know I've been talking about it a little while, but we are going to be changing studios potentially by the next time we talk, Dane, Ooh. you can find us on YouTube at locked on Oilers. There exactly how it sounds. Let's wrap it up there, folks. How do you think the play? Playoffs have been so far, and who do you think will move on on to the next round? Thank you so much for joining us today on Locked On NHL Western Conference Tuesdays. We shall see you next week where we will have a better picture as to who will be in the second round. See you then, everybody.